Hey everyone, today on The Final Bar, we'll talk about the S&P 500 testing 4,600. Do we continue to push above that next level of resistance? Gold having a nice week, testing $2,000 an ounce. In today's poll, we'll ask whether that makes new all-time highs through the end of this year. And also a big week from earnings. A lot of different companies reporting, including two FANG stocks, Amazon and Apple. Do they have enough what it takes to push higher? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the action in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. A lot of fun being back in the studio today. I was on vacation all last week. Special thanks to my guest hosts. We also had some really fun special uh, episodes of the show. So if you missed our top charts of, uh, for August, uh, a special Q&A. Make sure you uh, go to all of our uh, last week episodes on our YouTube channel. When we look forward to this week, I think about the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the major averages in a position of strength, right? From a trend following perspective, there's no denying that the trend is positive. And as Paul Montgomery said, as we quote often on the show, the most bullish thing the market can do is go up. The question is, when does that end, right? As Greg Morris, one of my mentors always says, that all new highs are bullish except the last one. So how do we sort of anticipate when we may be nearing the end of that rally? Well, I'm looking at comments from my friend uh, Matt Maley at Miller Tabak, others talking about overvaluations, but also just the idea that, you know, should we be further optimistic from here just based on the fact that there's a soft landing, right? That a recession is maybe less likely or not happening. Is that enough to justify stocks going even further from where they've already come uh, so far? This week, a big earnings week with energy stocks, payment processors like PayPal, Square, uh, Block, um, others like Fang stocks, Amazon and Apple. I think by the end of this week, we could get a lot of potential catalysts for a potential rotation lower in growth stocks. But let's make sure we let the charts tell us the uh, story. And with that in mind, let's get to our market recap and look at what actually happened in the market today. Our poll question, as I mentioned in the introduction, related to gold. We asked you recently on our social media accounts and on our YouTube channel, so make sure you subscribe to it, of course. We ask you, does gold make a new all-time high, over $2,100 an ounce before year-end 2023? 59% of you responding affirmatively, yes, we're going to make a new all-time high, only 41% saying no. You know, it's interesting. When you look at the chart of gold, you know, a couple things to think about. Number one, from a trend-following perspective, what's the trend in gold? And again, just like we talk about with the S&P or the NASDAQ, I would argue that the trend in gold has been pretty positive. GLD, not too much of a change today. But you can see that as of uh, Friday's close, gold testing that big round number right at $20,000, or excuse me, $2,000, not $20,000. $2,000 an ounce right here. And this is after bouncing off of support right around 1900. What's interesting about the chart of gold is if you take the November 2022 low, the May 2023 high, 38.2% of the way down is right around 1906. That's pretty much right where we bottomed out at the end of June, beginning of July. And from there, we've now broken back above the 50 day moving average. We're now making a higher low around 1940 and we're making a new swing high. So today's move, a little bit higher, kind of continuing that trend that's been in place for the last uh, four to six weeks. So overall, it certainly seems to be setting up for a retest of all time highs. If it can get above big round number resistance and the high here in early June was right at 2000. I think if it does get above there, which it certainly seems to be threatening to do this week, I think a push to all time highs uh, makes sense. My question, I guess the follow up question to the poll is if you did say yes, you think it's going to new all time highs, what does it tell us about the conditions for equities, for risk assets, if gold is plowing to $2,100 an ounce plus, right? That is a traditionally more of a safe haven type of asset. Uh, it's possible that stocks and gold move up together. Much more likely that gold rallying could be a sign that other areas of the market maybe are deteriorating and gold could be a good alternative to that. So it might be interesting to watch the correlation between stocks and gold, uh, gold here in the, next, uh, in the next couple weeks to next couple months. Let's keep going with our market recap. As I mentioned, kind of a quiet day overall, although a nice rally going into the close for, uh, for the S&P and the NASDAQ. Still not much gain uh, to the upside. The S&P finished the day up about 0.1.2%, so pretty much unchanged for the day. We finished around 4589, so we're still below that 4600 level. 
Now, and again, not that 4,600, I think, has any particular meaning, but big round numbers like uh, 4,500, 4,600 are a natural time to sort of, stay, take a, sort of take a step back and see where we've come from, think about where we may go next. And when the market stalls at a big round number, a lot of time that can be a little bit uh, telling. Of course, the biggest number is 4,800, which was the high from uh, the last couple of years, the all-time high in the S&P 5,000, of course, a significant Big round number above current levels. We have a long way to go, I feel, between now and there. The Dow and the Nasdaq both outperforming the S&P, but not by much. The Nasdaq also up just about 0.2%. Mid caps and small caps moving higher as well. The S&P 600 small cap index finishing the day up 0.9%. That's the best performer of that group. The VIX actually moving higher. So friendly reminder, a PSA, when we think about uh, stocks, and volatility, we are programmed, I think, to taught to think that they move inversely. And over time, that is certainly what that relationship has tended to be. But on individual days, I had a couple com uh, conversations with Dave Landry as a frequent guest and a uh, host his own show on Stock Charts TV about that relationship. You have to remember that stocks can move higher on higher volatility. They can move lower on lower volatility. But in general, a lower volatility environment is sort of like a first half of 2023 uh, 2021 is a good example of that, where the market is just kind of grinding higher, that slow and steady grind on low volatility. In this environment, some of the things I would be looking at, one, one thing in particular would be volatility rising. The VIX getting above 14, above 15. That sort of thing happens. Uh, that should be an indicator to you that, uh, that uh, things may start to get a little bit uncomfortable. By the way, something like that, you know, waiting for a line in the sand like the VIX above 14 or 15, a really good excuse to use the alert engine, the, the alert functionality on stock charts. Just set an alert for when the VIX gets above 15, then don't worry about the chart. Just wait to see when that alert triggers. Then that will tell you you need to revisit sort of the bullish thesis for uh, stocks overall. Let's look at some other asset classes here very quickly. So, of course, we had the Fed meeting last week. A big bearish engulfing pattern for the S&P on Thursday, but Friday and now into today kind of shrugging off the pretty negative reaction, I think, uh, sort of after the 24 hours after that. Uh, the uh, the Fed meeting last week. Ten-year yield, five-year yield, long bond yield today coming off a little bit, even though rates have been trending higher today coming off just a bit. 30-year yield right around 4.02 percent. Ten-year yield uh, just above, uh, just below 4 percent, really. The dollar index, not too much change, but I think that dollar chart might be an important one to watch. We'll talk about materials and uh, commodities in a minute, but dollar index over the last couple of weeks really rotating higher. And stronger dollar has often been uh, a, a, a significant part of a bearish phase, right? Stronger dollar, we've called a wrecking ball for risk assets. So maybe the beginning of that rally in the dollar might be a chart to watch as well. The commodity space is very interesting. The reason why we asked the, that in our poll uh, here recently was just to get you thinking about uh, commodities because those value-oriented areas of the market like energy, like financials, like industrials, like materials have really started to improve. Well, even though the first half of this year was all about growth, all about the FANG sectors like technology and communications, the second half of the year is all of a sudden feeling a lot more like a value discussion where we're talking about the overextended growth charts, but a lot of energy charts or industrials or materials you would probably not classify as uh, overextended. They're more up and coming. They're more emerging strength. And so I think, uh, you know, focusing on the commodity space, a number of my conversations with guests in the last six to eight weeks have been on materials and sort of the potential for an area like gold uh, or, uh, or other areas of, uh, of the uh, commodity space to show some strength. Energy is, in a, is in a, another idea there. Gold uh, today up about 0.3% for the GLD. The silver ETF SLV was up about 1.7%. Copper prices moving higher as well. Crude oil having a decent update as well. And the energy sector was the top performer out of the 11 S&P sectors today. You know, it's funny. I took a week off. I come back to find Bitcoin. I feel like almost at the exact same level. I feel like before we were flying down to Orlando to go to Disney, we we're talking about Bitcoin just below 30,000, sort of in that 28, 29,000 level is all about, do we get above that big round number? Talking about Bitcoin stalling out in its attempts to get above 30,000, pushing even to 31,000 before retracing down. Here we are a week, uh, week and a half later, Bitcoin's kind of right back where it started. So any upside momentum we had in Bitcoin to get up to 30,000 has certainly dissipated at this point. I think you're looking for a new catalyst to propel things higher. Now, what's interesting is Coinbase is actually one of the many stocks reporting earnings this week. It might be an interesting one because that is where a big discussion about cryptocurrencies tends to be magnified when you have the biggest uh, public uh, crypto-related name uh, reporting. Also, names like PayPal and Block with big exposure to 
uh, cryptocurrencies. Let's look at the sectors here, and then we'll look at a bunch of charts to finish off our market recap. The energy sector, the XLE, up 1.9% today, followed by real estate and then consumer discretionary. Real estate up 0.7%. Uh, I think the real story here is energy. When you look at charts like the XOP, we'll see how many of these we can get to, and some of the members of that, of that space, E&P stocks, exploration and production stocks like, uh, like Apache, maybe something like ConocoPhillips. Uh, some interesting rotation higher, testing resistance, but many of them actually starting to break out. I think that could be a really interesting uh, area to watch as we get into some uh, heavy earnings reports from that sector this week. On the downside, only three of the 11 S&P sectors down today on absolute terms. Uh, the healthcare sector leading the way down about 0.8% lower. Consumer staples, half a percent lower. Communication services essentially flat for the day. Let's go to our daily chart of the S&P 500. I was writing a note, uh, my weekly flight plan for my market misbehavior premium members earlier today and recording a video talking about a number of different uh, focuses on uh, or a number of different ideas related to uh, major benchmarks, uh, breadth and sentiment conditions. And one of the things we talked about was what we call accelerating trend lines or accelerated trend lines. And if you're not familiar with this, kind of a part of the trend line toolkit of the technical analyst. It starts with a basic trend line. And if I look at the S&P, the most striking trend line I can draw is from the October low of last year, the March low of this year. And you can see that's sort of the general trend in this market for sort of that six month period. But if you look at what happened in April, May, June, look at how the price got further and further away from this big uh, green uh, trend line down there. So what happens is when you get farther and farther away, that tells you the trend is accelerating, the slope is increasing. So you need to draw another trend line a secondary trend line taking that second point and a new, uh, a new point. So I connect these two points, and that's sort of our new definition of the trend. Look at what happened, though. In the last six to eight weeks, we've gotten even further. So now I've drawn a third accelerated trend line now from the May low and the June and July lows, and that's kind of lining up to where we're at today. So the general approach to this is you usually don't, don't draw any more than three of these accelerated trend lines. That's usually it uh, because things don't accelerate to infinity, right? They can't technically go straight up. So at some point, the slope is so extreme, things get overextended and you get a big retrenchment to the downside. Uh, what happens is you want to keep an eye on that last trend line and that's connecting the May low this early July and now the late July lows, as long as we hold above that, I would say the tactical trend in the S&P pretty strong. We start breaking that trend line, I think that's where you need to start looking at some of these subsequent lower trend lines for potential support, some of the other levels we've talked about. And as we've mentioned, if we would break lower for some reason this week, I'm looking at the 50-day moving average around 4380. That lines up with that second trend line that we drew. And that might be an area of potential support if we do get a pullback. Below there, we have the August highs from last year, right around 4300. So that would be a pretty logical downside target. Again, if and only if, and it's probably more, more when, we start to uh, retrace lower and break down. Now, what's interesting is as we talk about the S&P and the NASDAQ and the conditions that they're in, you have to remember that these benchmarks are comprised of individual names, and the strength in those names has really been what's driving it. And what's been driving the market uh, here in 2023, up until more relatively recently, has been the growth trade, right? And when I look at the RRG, the relative rotation graph, and look at the weekly time frame, what I'm, what I'm noticing here is that the growth sectors, technology, communication services, uh, consumer discretionary, are all headed south to southwest. This is what I like to call the direction of deterioration when things are rolling over and the momentum is decreasing. So it's still outperforming over that weekly time frame, but the trend is becoming or the momentum is becoming a, a lot less positive. So this is more of a leading uh, sector that is on the decline. The momentum starting to dry up. Think of it as a, uh, you know, a, 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 a car getting to the top of the hill, just barely having enough to get to the top. And then you sort of roll over. And that's sort of what is uh, maybe happening here. Look at what is rotating higher to take its place. It's those value oriented sectors like industrials, materials, financials. Um, these are areas of the market that have been underperforming these growth sectors, but are really starting to improve. On the daily RG, you find that sort of uh, movement has been echoed with sectors like financials uh, having a nice bounce higher and starting to rotate uh, higher. So that sort of rotation is something that is top of mind for me as we exit July, which has tended to be a pretty strong month in pre-election years. 
to August and September, which has actually been relatively weak. If you look at the seasonal trends, think about my conversations uh, with people like Jeff Hurst that really focus on seasonality, and they will tell you that July into August and September tend to be the weakest part of the year. And so we're sort of at that point where if growth had been dominant and now is starting to lighten up, this is the time of the calendar where it actually makes perfect sense based on historical cycles and historical trends. So that's sort of at the back of my mind as I'm looking at stocks like uh, Apple and others that are actually reporting uh, earnings this week. Let's take a look at the chart of Apple here. I'll refresh it uh, with, uh, with the uh, most recent data here. What's interesting about the chart of Apple is you see the rally higher. Looking here on the daily chart, we can see just this incredibly strong uptrend. I'm looking at the 13-day EMA in uh, yellow. This is the 50-day simple moving average in green. You can see we've just been in this nice, consistent uptrend. We haven't even touched the 50-day moving average since January. So from there, it's just been this nice, consistent uptrend. But if you look recently, we have this dreaded bearish momentum divergence, which I'm, I've mentioned so many times on the show, but it basically is an indication of price strength, but weaker momentum. And that often is a sign of something rotating lower, of an exhaustion point in an uptrend. Um, think about something, uh, you know, other names that are sort of in that, uh, you know, strong uptrend, but potentially showing a little bit of weakness. Something like Meta comes to mind. Let's get this... Uh, Zoomed in a little bit so you can see the price moving higher. Again, not even touching the 50-day moving average, but the momentum sloping downwards over the last uh, six to eight weeks. Uh, Adobe is another one. This has been uh, one of the top performing uh, FANG stocks, again, making a new swing high, a new high for the year today. But again, over the last uh, eight weeks or so, we've seen lesser momentum as we've made new highs. Now, what's interesting is a lot of other names have actually already rotated lower and have pulled back a little bit. I'm thinking of something like Microsoft which is actually right now testing its 50-day moving average. Other names like an Alphabet, for example, tested their 50-day moving average back here, uh, early, uh, sort of late June, early mid-July, sort of bounced around the 50-day moving average, resolved to the upside. And I think gapping above uh, 130 for Alphabet, certainly a really big uh, you know, uh, bullish uh, development for the chart. After that bearish div uh, divergence there in May, we rotated lower to the 50-day, but now the buy on the dips approach so far looking pretty strong as long as it holds that uh, upper end of that gap here around 128, we'll call it. But other names like Microsoft are actually pulled back. And so I think, you know, a bullish market phase seems names like this pull back to a 50-day and then rotate higher. These types of stocks fail to hold that level and I would start to be uh, concerned. Sorry, I mistyped, fat fingered the chart of Netflix. Here we go. We can see the chart of Netflix also pulling back to a 50 day moving average. Uh, and again, for now, bouncing higher. It's sort of interesting. Uh, but, you know, can it hold that 50 day? Again, I think the model of what could happen would be something like an alphabet, which pulled back to its 50 day and bounced. For now, Amazon pulling back to an ascending 50 day moving average and rotating higher. The question mark for me, as we start to see this rotation to these growth areas of the market, which are overextended by so many classic definitions, they start to fail to hold support for now. They appear to be holding. We're gonna come back here in a minute with the uh, questions from our final bar mailbag. Before we do that, a couple quick announcements. First off, we welcome your questions. Our mailbag is fueled by people like you sending in your questions. Email is the best way to get a hold of us. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email address. You can tag us on X, or what we'll still call Twitter, I think, until told otherwise, at Final Bar SCTV. And on our YouTube channel, of course, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to hear from you, especially your questions. We'll hope to answer one of yours in our next mailbag segment on Friday's show. Also, as a serious heads up, today, July 31st, the end of our surprise summer special. If you've thought about being a premium Stock Charts member, now is the time to do it. It's one of the best deals I've seen in my time at Stock Charts. It's really an opportunity to lock in a low rate uh, now. If you're an existing member, by the way, you can sign up now, extend your membership at the current low rate. That is a really good time to do so. Find more information about what all is involved and the great deals you can get. Go to stockcharts.com slash special. Let's continue on today's show. Uh, answering questions from the Final Bar Mailbag. Thanks again so much, everyone, for sending in your great questions. And here is question number one. Dave, why in the gallery view have you chosen 10-minute versus a more popular 60-minute chart? And I think you're talking about the intraday chart in our, um, in our gallery view. So just to take a few moments, if you're not familiar with gallery view, I remember at one point I did a special uh, video on 
you know, secret parts of stock charts or, or lesser known, you know, uh, tips and tricks of using the platform. And one of them that we talked about is gallery view. There are a bunch of really cool features in the gallery view, and it's really designed to help you think about multiple timeframes. The way that you access gallery view, by the way, is at the top of our stock charts platform, and this is a within the main stock charts website, it usually defaults to sharp charts. So if you bring up a stock like Electronic Arts, it brings up that chart for that particular name. But if you change this, you can bring up all sorts of different things. And what we're going to do today is go to gallery view and then bring up the same stock EA. What happens is this now combines an intraday chart, a daily chart, a weekly chart and a point and figure chart. It's a really cool way to think about how all of these different timeframes, all these different visualizations are related. And it's really intended for you to start at the top and start to go down. So let's start with what happened today with Electronic Arts. And let's think about what today, how that fits into the overall trend of the last six to 12 months. And then let's go even further and look at the longer term view, the weekly view. Let's look at the point and figure chart and see if there are any key patterns, key price objectives we may have reached or things to think about in terms of the trend. Now, what you may have noticed as I'm flicking through my own gallery view is it might look very different from yours. And this is where we answer your question. We default to a set of charts that we think are a good starting point, but they are just that. They are a starting point. They are not intended to be an ending point. I think most of the stock charts platform is really designed that way. We chart, try to give you a start, give you some tools to start with, but then eventually, hopefully, you make the platform your own. With a login as a paid member, you really have the opportunity to customize uh, the, uh, the platform really, really well, including chart styles. And that is the trick you use to change what is in your gallery view. There's this little gray message just below the ticker at the top of gallery view that says, stock charts members, customize your gallery view charts. If you click on le learn how, it tells you what to do. You actually use our chart, uh, chart styles. So you create a chart with this name, gallery daily, exactly as it's listed here, gallery weekly, Gallery Interday, whatever chart style you save with that particular name, that's what our platform is going to look for. So what I did was I said, you know, when I run the gallery view, I want a five-day, five-minute chart. Because for me, that's the most important time frame I want to think about when I'm looking intraday. I then want to do a 12-month daily view with RSI and relative strength. I want to do a five-year weekly view with RSI and PPO. And then I want to use this particular point and figure chart defaulting to the percentage terms. So the way I did it was by saving chart styles in each one of these. So literally, if I go to a, an individual chart, you'll see I actually have a chart style called Gallery Daily, Gallery Intraday, Gallery Weekly. That is how you can customize it. So again, if you don't like 10 minutes, totally fine. Make an hourly chart, make a one-minute chart, five-minute chart. It's completely up to you. Again, you have to be a Stock Charts member. Really good time, by the way, to go get a special now because tools like this are how you really can customize the platform and make it your own and make it uh, help you answer the questions that you're really trying to, uh, to answer. So that is the answer to uh, the gallery view. 10 minutes is a starting point. I actually use five minutes. You are encouraged to experiment with different chart styles, and that is how you do it. Save those chart styles with those particular names, and then you can run it on your own custom gallery view. Next question. Dave, what is your observation on once popular EV stocks? Any green shoots out there? Anything to get excited about? So what's interesting is if I'm looking at a, a ticker like uh, IDRV, you mentioned some names like Lucid and Rivian and, and uh, in your question. I appreciate that. We'll look at each of those if we, have a, if we have a minute. When I'm looking at a group like electronic vehicles, I like to, or electric vehicles, I like to start with uh, an ETF. That's usually a good starting point. And while it might not be the, the answer, it might not be the total picture, it just gives you a sense, right? How has this group done relative to other things that I could have looked at? And the things that I'm tending to focus on when I'm looking at IDRV, this is the iShares uh, uh, EV um, uh, ETF. There are others that are out there as well. But this is a fairly liquid, uh, sort of decent, uh, decent uh, price series to look at. What strikes me about the chart of iDrive, uh, to your point, is I think that it's actually been, it's actually way more constructive than I would have thought. When I think of the charts of uh, Lucid, which has kind of been languishing, right, underperforming charts like Tesla and Rivian, the, uh, the iDrive uh, ETF is actually pretty good. Now, Tesla's a pretty big weight in this, as you would, uh, you would probably guess, but I like the resistance around 43 here in February. It broke above the February high, pulled back to 43 and now rotating higher. Uh, the momentum for now, strong but not excessive, uh, and overall the relative strength has been positive, especially over the last three months. Look from uh, late April to where we're at now, last three months have been pretty positive, right? So it's been outperforming, and we can tell that by the fact that the line relative to the SPY has been going up. Now, let's think about some of the individual stocks that make up this ETF that I would argue pretty constructive chart. 
First place I would think to go is Tesla. When you look at the chart of Tesla, you can see why an ETF with exposure to Tesla has done particularly well in the last couple months. Now, what's happened in the last couple weeks is Tesla, of course, has gapped lower, traded up to $300 share, came down. On something like this, I'm on watch for a lower uh, low, right? So if you look, this swing low here in June was around 240. The 50-day moving average currently around 246, 247. So if 240 holds, that would keep a higher low above that June low. I think the chart of Tesla is still pretty good. We start breaking below 240, all of a sudden the 200-day moving average comes in play. All of a sudden we're thinking about the $200 level and what that further downside would be as we retest the February high. What concerns me about the chart of Tesla is the higher highs and lower peaks in momentum, the dreaded bearish momentum divergence. As I mentioned, a lot of growth stocks, like some of the ones that I mentioned in the uh, market recap, all featuring that sort of pattern, which is one of the many data points that suggests to me that that growth leadership trade may be uh, at or near an exhaustion point. Now, two other names that you mentioned in your question, which I think are, are fair to review, Rivian and Lucid. And what's it's interesting is that you, as you think about these three charts, what strikes me is how different they are, right? The EV space is not just one chart. It's a number of different charts. There's actually quite a bit of differentiation between these. If you look at the chart of, uh, of Rivian, it's all about this gap higher, a series of gaps higher, actually, that happened at the end of June, right around the 4th of July holiday weekend. And you can see this final gap higher. And I think what was most telling was we gapped above the 200-day moving average, and then we kept going. Gaps are really interesting to see what happens afterwards, right? When we gap higher and all of a sudden the stock has gone from 20 to 25 overnight, do investors continue to want to buy, right? Do additional buyers come in and push the price higher? And that's what we've seen with the chart of Rivian so far. Again, the caution I have is the uh, divergence that you see with momentum uh, lessening over the last couple of weeks. But overall, I'm going to follow price more than anything. I think the chart of, uh, of Rivian for now uh, is, is certainly in a, in a, uh, in a consistent uptrend. Lucid, less uh, exciting. You'd mentioned in your question, do you need to wait for it to get above $8 or, or some particular level? I was taught nothing good happens below the 200-day moving average. And again, that is not a hard and fast rule that I follow, but it's certainly striking to me when I look at a series of charts that are all above the 200-day, then I look at Lucid, which is just below a downward sloping 200-day moving average. And that's the way I could describe this chart since April of last year, being below a downward sloping 200-day moving average. I would be interested in a chart like this if it can get back above the 200-day. That is where I would start to get interested. A higher low here in mid-July is encouraging. So I would say holding that low is pretty important. For me, I'd be setting an alert around this July high, around the 200-day moving average. We eclipsed that, and I would agree with you. That's where that particular name starts to look a little bit more constructive. But again, I would say that uh, in terms of the larger play on, a, on an ETF like IDRV, I think very constructive with a recent breakout that I think is, uh, is pretty positive. Next question, is XLV, the healthcare ETF, making a bullish triangle or a rounding top? And you actually asked this about the weekly chart of the, uh, of the XLV. So let me bring up my weekly chart of the XLV. And I think you're talking about this pattern here. You know, it's so interesting when you look at the weekly chart of, uh, of the healthcare, look at how strong this was, of course, with the drop in, uh, in the first quarter of 2020. But after that COVID drop, just the uptrend continued like nothing had ever happened, right? And again, healthcare, of course, was in that recovery. That was one of those great COVID plays in 2020, the market getting crushed for a while, healthcare really starting to improve. 2021, healthcare doing particularly well also. 2022 was actually interesting because the S&P, the NASDAQ getting absolutely killed. Big time bearish year, but look at where uh, the XLV actually did. It finished the year 2022 not far below where it started the year, which most sectors could not make that uh, make that claim. We're certainly, uh, you know, making the claim of having a sideways year in a really difficult uh, market environment. The problem is in 2023, which has been a very bullish year for stocks, the XLV maintaining sort of that sideways trend. So my initial take on a chart like this on the weekly chart is what I call a consolidation phase, right? A consolidate, I think of the market in three phrase, phases at any time. It's an accumulation phase, which means it's going up, a distribution phase, which means it's going down, or a consolidation phase, which means there's some rectangle you can draw around the price action. That's probably what I would do with this uh, chart is sort of draw a loose rectangle around this price action. Get excited if we can break above uh, that rectangle, which means the XLV getting to a new high above 140 would be pretty, uh, would be pretty constructive. When you're talking about a bullish triangle, I think you're talking about this here. If you think of 140 as resistance, 
the uh, increasing slope in the lows, which would mean a break above 140 would be pretty bullish because it would complete that ascending triangle. I don't disagree with that uh, with that way of describing it. I would not describe this as a rounding top because a rounding top actually has a particular look. This one with the secondary high here is not a rounding top would need to have like another couple highs up in this area. So it would really be, you know, a rounding period. This is more flat. This is more a consistent resistance level around 135, 140. So I would think of it more as a consolidation phase. And whether you label it a triangle, which I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't red mark that one. I think that's okay or whether you just call it a consolidation phase, which is how I would probably label it. In either case, a break above 140 really changes the character of this chart. That's what I would probably be patient for. Next question. Dave, any plans to add sector or industry data for Indian stocks? I really appreciate that question, to be honest with you. And, you know, when we think about our data platform, uh, you know, we cover a series of markets, the U.S. and Canada. Uh, primarily, we've added India, the U.K., and we have plans to add a lot more non-U.S. markets. It's all about a question of data, and we want to make sure that we have the right database set up and the right way to bring all that data and, and, and do it in a way that we're comfortable with. Uh, that speaks to the strength of our technical analysis platform. We do cover the Indian markets. I would love to see us cover those things a lot more deeply. Uh, we definitely can add sector and industry classifications. I actually just talked to uh, Julius DeKempner, who actually uh, spearheads our data effort these days. Uh, earlier today when I saw your question, uh, we are going to look at that development queue and make sure we can get it on there. The reason why I wanted to point this out was I really appreciate uh, suggestions like this. The best thing that you can do to help us prioritize it is send a note to our uh, support staff. So if you go to stockcharts.com, click on help in the upper right, and just put in the comment of what you're looking for, what feature you're looking for. We literally look for how many people are requesting, how many users are requesting a particular feature. That's how we prioritize it. The more requests we get, the higher we tend to put it in the queue because we want to get things to the most people that are going to find value in those uh, in those new features. So I like how we're covering Indian stocks. Uh, Milan Vaishnav is based in uh, India and is one of our uh, contributors, uh, has done a very good job of, uh, of covering the Indian markets for us. We've talked with him and on my trip to Mumbai in November of last year, we talked about some additions to our platform to help cover the Indian markets. We have a lot of really good plans for that, including sector and industry data, market cap as well, which I know you mentioned in your question. So other things like that, please make sure that you send a note to our support desk. You also mentioned the market carpet. And by the way, 100%, yes, I, I think we will, we will absolutely plan to get uh, the Indian markets uh, represented in there. We're currently still in test mode for this. So we're just making sure we cover our current data as well. But if you have not checked out the new market carpet, this is a technology preview. It is not completely done. Think of it as a beta test. We're putting it out there to gather feedback and just make sure that it works well with all the data and all the different parts of our platform. But if you go to your dashboard in the upper left, you'll find three things that I would encourage you to check out now. Our Sharp Charts Workbench, Sharp Charts 3.0, which is a completely new UI design for our Sharp Charts platform and the charting engine itself is being redesigned from, uh, from square one and also our new market carpets. I really love this visualization. I think our developers have done a fantastic job of making it a very stock charts-like uh, look, but also improving on, uh, on some great uh, heat map capabilities that we can do. If you click on all the dropdowns, you find we have a lot of great uh, technical uh, and uh, price-related data. We're going to incorporate more fundamental data and also a lot more markets. We have different fund families. We're looking at ETFs and also non-US markets uh, as well. So more to come for sure. We started with a group of things that we, uh, that we did for, for the uh, preview, but Indian markets will certainly include as well. Final question, then we have to wrap the show. Dave, what's your take on PPO downward momentum against price action in SWKS, which is Skyworks. That's actually a uh, semiconductor name. And you're looking at the PPO. So let's bring that up on the bottom of the chart here. All right, so we're looking at price and PPO. I get what you're saying. So what you're, what you're pointing out is here, right? Price has been going up. The PPO had been going up, but now all of a sudden starting to rotate lower. And, and, and you, further in your question, you say when you see that divergence of price going higher, but the PPO starting to roll over, what wins, right? Does price tend to play out or does momentum tend to be a better leading indicator for price? And I think it's much more often the latter than the former. And what I mean by that is, the momentum as defined by RSI or PPO, whatever indicator you're using, I have found to be a much better indicator of the underlying strength or weakness in a trend than price itself. And that is really the essence of any divergence that we would highlight. A lot of the charts that we mentioned, charts like uh, Microsoft or Meta, uh, Adobe, Apple, NVIDIA, 
These are names that have been going higher, but charts, uh, indicators like RSI or PPO or MACD have all started to rotate lower. And that divergence is what's concerning because it tells you that even though the price is going higher, the momentum, right, sort of the, the, the pressure below that upward move is starting to dissipate. And that is often characteristic of the end of a move, not earlier on in the move, but the later innings or sort of in the fourth quarter, not the first quarter of that uptrend, according to that indicator. So I'm concerned when I see price making new swing highs and the indicator like PPO actually breaking down. So technically a sell signal here a couple of weeks ago. And when you have a chart like that, that's kind of like a pretzel chart where it's a little hard to find below our, uh, our, our stock charts uh, window, or the sharp chart, you can see this little guy called Zoom thumbnail. That'll sort of break out the most recent data in a little easier to see format. That's actually a really nice trick. If the indicator is kind of compressed and you're trying to figure out what it is, that's a really nice sort of quick way to do it. You can see the sell signal we got about a week and a half ago where the PPO line crossed down through the signal line, the MACD indicator, the same exact signal. Then that's suggesting some short-term weakness here. Certainly has suggested that the uptrend is now uh, in a pause mode. So on a shorter time frame, you see an accumulation phase and now a bit of a consolidation phase. Now, this sort of divergence can be uh, invalidated or it can be corrected. And what happens is the price breaks out and the momentum starts to improve again. So this sort of chart is important to see if the PPO can go back to a buy signal, then it can often be an indication of much further upside to be had. But for now, yes, I'm concerned on a chart like this with the price moving higher and an indicator like RSI or in this case, PPO, not confirming those recent highs, short term telling you more weakness then strength. Folks, that's it for the uh, mailbag. Let's get right to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, of course, in a nice rally phase. No denying the strength that we've seen. Higher highs, higher lows. Both of these indexes above an upward sloping 50-day moving average. Conditions are good. The problem is we're finding breadth indicators continuing to show overextended conditions. What we highlighted a couple of weeks ago was the bullish percent index for the S&P 500, for the NASDAQ 100 getting above 70%. What that means is over 70% of the members of those indexes are in a bullish point figure chart. And that usually suggests we're near the end of a rally phase. Look at what has happened when these uh, end of these red shaded areas, when the indicator has gone above 70%, then back below. If you look back at the last 18, 24 months, you can see that that's pretty much identified the end of these major rally phases that we've seen, both in down phases like 23 or 22 and upward phases like, uh, you know, end of 22 into 23. So I will be concerned when I see this indicator coming down below 70 percent for now. It's just telling you we're at the later stages of an established rally phase. Chart number two is looking at gold. We highlighted the GLD and the gold uh, contract coming off of, uh, of a retest of all-time highs, just below 2100. We bounced off the Fibonacci support at the end of June, and now we're back above the 50-day moving average. The PPO gave a brilliant buy signal there the first week in July, and it's been lights out upside from there. We're now just getting above $2,000 a share. And my question in the poll was, do we get to new all-time highs? I think we do. We have about 80, 70 points uh, left to get back to that point. But I think this chart might be an important one to watch. And think about what that might mean for risk assets. If a consistent defensive area of the market like gold continues to push to new all-time highs. Finally, we have some heavy earnings this week. A lot of the shows this week, we're going to be focused on stocks reporting earnings before and after the close, what the charts look like going into that report and coming out of that report. I'm thinking of particularly of stocks like Apple and Amazon with both report on Thursday, I think after the close. And if you look at the chart of Amazon, this really tells the story of the growth trade in a nutshell. Higher highs in June and July, lower momentum. So we have this bearish momentum divergence. The stock has now pulled back to a 50-day moving average, and for now, bouncing higher. I think earnings this week do one of two things. Either just continue this uptrend and tell you stocks like Amazon have further upside potential, higher highs and higher lows if we can get above 135, or we have a downside catalyst and we get below the 50-day moving average. The buy on the dip strategy does not work, and all of a sudden we start to see pain. I'm thinking of charts like Alphabet that have actually already done that test and have bounced higher. Do we see that sort of mood at move uh, echoed in Apple? and Amazon. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Don't forget to go to stockcharts.com slash special for all the information on our special summer event. Ladies and gentlemen, for stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.